um, the name of the game is A, to prevent the attack from taking place, but B, to also uh, bring, to, uh, bring to court a case that will stand up and uh, secure um, uh, conviction. So it's been the policization of counterintelligence up to a point. In a way, yes. And basically, the role of intelligence in these investigations is to provide the lead intelligence, which enables the police know, to know where to go to look for the evidence. Now, in the European model, this would be a very difficult thing to do because, as I just mentioned, the political elites and uh, judiciaries are profoundly distrustful of intelligence in any court case in most European countries that uh, was demonstrably um, the product of evidence based on the intelligence, I think, would struggle to, to get some... You're also talking right. about it, often communities that conventional police have a lot of a problem with anyway, right? Yeah. I mean, the Paris suburbs, you know, yeah. is not a place that police are good at operating. They're not good at operating, in, and, and at the end of the day, no matter how much the technology enables you, uh, I mean, you know, there's always you know, a kind of action-reaction dynamic in terms of you know, how the technology works. At the end of the day, you need two-legged sources in these communities, and it's quite clear that in some European countries, they have few, if any, and that is something that clearly is going to have to be uh, have to be addressed. I mean, we you know, we we know obviously we know that France and Belgium have their problems. I mean, what what do we know about places like Germany and Italy that have a lot of people that have a very large number of yeah. arrived migrants passing through? Um, well, and also um, their own governmental issues and, and, and very serious history with intelligence services doing what you think. Yeah, well, uh, that, this is absolutely right. I mean, you know, the fact is that in Germany, the, the intelligence community that was established in the aftermath of World War II was designed primarily to prevent it from becoming a Gestapo again. Um, so what you've got, is you, you've got a, a federal um, security agency, the Bundesverfassungsschutz, the uh, your office for the protection of the constitution, which I think you know, is very interesting. Uh, in no, no, not, not, not the main tasking of most intelligence agencies. No, exactly. And and and, and every every land you know, um, has its own uh, landers for personal ships, uh, in separate you know, office for the protection of the constitution at a you know, uh, at a, if you like provincial uh, level. Uh, you, you, you also got a, you know, a foreign intelligence service, uh, the, the BND, which is both a, a human agency and a civilian agency. Um, um, and you know, the, 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 you know, the Germany has considerable, you know, the, 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 the German state collectively has considerable powers. They've also got a federal police service, which is actually uh, um, and, and the counter terrorism in the seventy That's right. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, and, and so you know they 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 are not bad, but I think the problem with the Germans is that they are held back again. It's a, a political class that has basically failed, yeah, you know, done two things wrong. I think they they have failed to take effective ownership of uh, their intelligence community. Um, you know there there are all sorts of mechanisms for oversight, but uh, they have not taken ownership. This. I mean, all the fuss that took place over Snowden and the handling of, handing of uh, German data to national security agency here. I mean, you know, we all know that this was done with the authority of a senior politician. Uh, the BND would not have done it uh, without that. But uh, everyone, you know, it, you know, the prevailing political fiction in Germany is that this was the BND you know, operating on their own. And this, I think, is you know, emblematic of the kind of relationship that, that exists. The other thing I think Germany. You know, Germany has you know, politically is that their own politicians have not really been um, uh, have not really succeeded in persuading the German people of the value of security as a public good, uh, and that's this is a, a problem they're struggling with. Um, so, and I think this is true uh, of European states you know, generally to, to to varying degrees, as we've seen to some extent from the reactions to the Snowden uh, revelations that. Uh, you know, the value of security as a public good has not really been um, an element in, 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 the, in the debate. Uh, this is now, um, I think, starting to change. I mean, uh, if we're looking at, um, I mean, how, how important is the migrant crisis as, 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 a, yeah. as, a, as a driver of what we're seeing here? Because it certainly makes the politics harder, but it yeah. also makes the, the tactical kind of terrorism harder, right? Well, it does, but I think uh, the, that um, um, the, the the kind of narrative that suggests that the uh, migrant tide that is now sweeping uh, Western Europe is a kind of Trojan horse enabling Islamic State to infiltrate uh, 
multiple operatives um, into into Europe, I think, is uh, widely seen um, as uh, not reflecting reality. It's certainly the case that some, you know, we know that some individuals involved in the Paris attacks were able to uh, uh, re-enter Europe uh, through that route. But that was, you know, simply a tactical decision. That this was the easiest way to do it in particular and cases. And this is where the organised crime then comes. This is right? where they would have got it exactly. by another route anyway. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're there. so so I, I think that's you know, I, I think that's not such a concern. You know, the real the real concern is is, is the, the 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 threat of terrorism coming from people who live in these places. You know, second, third generation, and in principle have every right to be there. And, and again, have the communities that may and have the communities that will actually. To, varying degrees support them. So, so there's a huge amount of work to do here. I think the migrant issue is much more about the, you know, the politics of Europe, you know, the, the, the sustainability of Schengen, um, you know, the, the ability of what is still you know, um, the world's you know, uh, most prosperous and largest trading bloc to actually uh, deal with um, a crisis which in terms of absolute numbers ought not to be a crisis but because of the political, cultural uh, and other factors has, has, has become uh, an incredibly divisive and disruptive uh, issue within uh, in between European governments. I think that's the problem there rather than you know the, 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 this migrant tide as a kind of vector enabling uh, terrorist groups to, you know, to, to, to get in where they otherwise might not. I mean, it, a lot of it does come down to external border control at the moment, because that is, yeah. I mean, that, that's where you, you've got both the issue yeah. of people and, 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 and firearms. Yeah, and, and, and here, of course, it's, it's, it's quite clear that much more needs to be done. I mean, you know, this is one of the arguments that we get um, being repeated um, in the context of the <coughs> British um, um, referendum on leaving uh, the EU, that if we leave the European Union, we will be recover control of our borders. Well, okay. It's still uh, quite a large moat. Yes, indeed. I mean, yeah, and we, we, well, we do. Uh, and, and the fact is that I think Pauline Neville Jones pointed out in an article she wrote in the Telegraph a little while ago, um, actually, um, um, European nationals coming to the UK who have uh, uh, adverse uh, information recorded against them are refused entry. You know, the problem is, of course, that not always, you know, the adverse information doesn't always become available. But my, my broader point is that, uh, you know, uh, we live in a world where migration is something we're simply going to have to get used to. Because, you know, the, if you look at the, 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 the broad uh, global geostrategic and geoeconomic forces that are driving this tide of immigration, it's very, very difficult to see you know, how a bunch of uh, guys in, uh, in, in uniforms wielding visa stamps are, 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 are going to stop it. But what's your feeling on Brexit? I mean, do you think, on balance, the argument is moving, or the, 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 the popular opinion is moving towards it or away from it? I think it, it, you know, these things are notoriously difficult to call. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, my, my understanding is, is of this is limited, but, but what I think is happening is that um, the um, the Remain campaign is uh, suffering, as was the case with the Scottish referendum, referendum, from an ability to construct a narrative that grabs people by the viscera. It's a very rational and logical set of arguments that are being put out, uh, whereas the um, exit campaign is driven more uh, by uh, emotion and, and, and passion, so you know that that, that is a very you know, that is a difficult problem. I think the the, the other factor is there is a concern that um, the elderly demographic uh, that is instinctively uh, in favour of exit will vote, whereas the younger demographic that is instinctively in favour of uh, remaining uh, may not vote. Uh, so you know that that that. So you think concern. it could happen, but probably won't, or could happen, but probably will. Well, I was talking to um, one 
ambassador in London about this recently, somebody who's been around the circuit uh, quite a lot and in whose judgment I have a lot of confidence, he thought it would probably be 60-40 in favour of remaining. Which is roughly the same as the Scottish referendum. Scottish referendum. And of course, a, a figure like that would not kill the debate. It would simply you know, mark an inflection point before the next um, you know, time you know, we, we went, you know what I mean? A, an outcome like that won't settle anything. You know, the, 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 the no vote has to be you know, 30% or less, I think, if, you know, before you can say, okay, that's absolutely it, settled, you know, no, no need to come back. And we see in the, you know, in the, in the press the, the lively debate about we will be more safe, less safe, more at risk from terrorism, less at risk from terrorism if we you know, leave, go. Well, I mean, the bottom line is, you know, given our you know, inability to predict the future, uh, none of these claims is inherently, um, you know, is by definition, uh, capable of being proved you know, in, in an empirical way. We just can't know because there are so many factors that we can't anticipate. But you know, what I do know is this, is, is that broadly speaking, um, when it comes to the intelligence and security community, um, they will never say this because you know, they, they, they have to remain outside the debate. But uh, I know they feel very strongly that, that uh, you know, they, 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 they would have a harder time of things if they were out of Europe than if they remain in. I mean, the segue is quite nice. The other thing I want to talk about, which is the, the, the rise of resurgence, rash, resurgence of Russia, it's kind of okay. almost, a, an, almost an opposite situation to the migrant crisis. The migrant crisis drives Europe apart, yeah. may, you know, may ultimately threaten the European Union. The rise of Russia, mm -hmm. on the other hand, push, seems to push people together yeah. and, and it's wound up strengthening NATO at least for the ultra short term. Well, you know, to a degree, that is true. I mean, it was very, it was very noteworthy that the 2014 uh, Newport summit, um, you know, uh, up until pretty much the moment it happened, had as its first agenda item, "What the hell is NATO now for?" Um, well, that answer. That mo question, mo moving on to the obvious, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. It, 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 it was purely demonstrated by that. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and by the time we actually got to the Newport summit, the agenda had uh, altered somewhat. Uh, item number one you know, um, was uh, uh, research in Russia. And yes, I mean, it has you know, had um, you know, some cohering effect and it has uh, driven um, um, you know, a greater you know, great focus and something of a response. But it certainly has resulted in uh, European nations flocking to spend their two plus percent of, of GDP on defence. And in any case, I think that's a fairly meaningless figure. And, unless you're the Poles, the Lithuanians, the yeah, Latvians. Who, exactly. Who have who always, you know, who always you know, have, have a sense of existential threat uh, given their history. So yeah, that is true. But what I mean, what is Russia really about? Um, I mean, I think you know, uh, uh, it, 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 it's become you know, fairly clear. That, that what Russia is about is probably not uh, recovering lost territory mm -hmm. from from the Soviet Empire. What Russia is about is uh, playing a spoiling role uh, and uh, having the ca capability um, to keep uh, states on its periphery off balance. You know that that in, that in a nutshell is it. You know the the, the Russian military. Um, um, uh, reorganization and re-equipping uh, that, that, that has taken place has actually been quite effective to some degree, um, but it hasn't translated into a significant expeditionary capability. You know, the, 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 the Russian military can't really operate uh, much beyond you know, their, 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 their own borders. And in Syria, where they have their sovereign base. Where they have their sovereign base, and actually, you know, and, and of course, the support of, uh, <coughs> and consent of the regime. So, so I mean, I mean, if you look at what Russia has done in Crimea, in Ukraine, um, you know, nibbling at the edges of the Baltic republics, um, it really shouldn't have been that hard, and it hasn't been that hard, um, you know, certainly to, you know, to, to do, do what they did uh, in Ukraine. But it's interesting that uh, you know, Putin has stopped talking about Novorossiya. Uh, he is quite, it's quite clear that he's realized he doesn't need to own this rather you know, shop-worn chunk of uh, real estate uh, full of rusting uh, Soviet-era uh, factories and, and mines. Um, it is sufficient for his purpose to be able to press the switch and uh, um, create destabilizing effects you know, whenever, whenever he wishes to do so. 
and I think you know, the same in Ukraine, in particular in Ukraine. But what we're seeing also Russia doing in, 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 in its in intelligence work is uh, looking for ways you know, to to prize a, a tire lever into in, into the cracks in European and NATO cohesion, um, funding extreme um, parties, whether on the left or the right within Europe, uh, promoting um, their own narrative. Um, this Dutch um, referendum, you know, Dutch vote on uh, support for Ukraine, I think is uh, you know, an, an, an interesting uh, case. Um, in this because the Russians have been trying to say it shaded the debate within the Netherlands. Yeah, absolutely, yes. And they, yeah, this is it. It's about trying to shade the debate. It's about trying to um, blur you know, the lines between truth and falsehood, uh, creating an alternative uh, narrative that you know, nobody actually believes, but does sufficiently muddy the waters uh, to, you know, to, to, create, to, to create uncertainty. And I think this is primarily what, what we're dealing with here. Uh, I mean, you know, we, we need, you know, let's, let's not forget that uh, um, Russia as a state is still in serious trouble. Um, it is, you know, it is, its economy remains excessively dependent on extractive industries um, and prices uh, not doing very well. You know, institutionally, um, I mean, you know, the, the, the fact is that the, that the Russian state you know, is a mafia state. The, the Panamanian uh, revelations simply you know, uh, provide more and more optic on, 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 on that situation. Um, and um, you know, Russia, you know, if you look at the demographics of Russia, they're still heading in the wrong direction. Um, the, you know, um, life expectancy uh, is nowhere near. Um, but by the European same token, people in Russia seem to quite like the yeah. resurgence they've seen in the last two years. I mean, it, it seems to be yeah. well in, in domestic people locally. Yes, and, 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 you know, and, and it has, it has you know, uh, appealed to a particular, uh, a particular psyche. I just trying to remember who it was said that you know, um, uh, Russia always goes through these cycles when they peep over the palisade, uh, like what they see, decide to give it a try, then get disenchanted and re retreat behind their palisade. And I think that's kind of what we're saying at the moment. But you know, we're not talking here about the Soviet Union. I mean, you know, the, you know, millions of Russians uh, travel freely, own property overseas, have money outside Russia. And indeed, this is actually a big problem for, for the Russian state, is that any Russian who's got money, first thing they're going to do is think which Swiss bank. Um, and, and, you know, but but so it, it, you know, the Soviet Union was a, was an open prison. You know, you could not get out. It was as simple as that. When we got Oleg Gordievsky out of uh, the Soviet Union, you know, the, the, the Soviets were absolutely discombobulated. This was something we'd done that was not supposed to be possible. Yeah. Uh, so it was an open prison. It's not an open prison anymore. And indeed, I mean, it kind of cuts both ways, right? In the, yeah. you, in the Russian hour in Tarp, London. Yeah, yeah. Which changes the dynamic in yeah. every conceivable dimension. And we saw this when uh, the, the, the press you know, push was on to impose economic sanctions because of uh, Crimea. You know, there was a very powerful constituency in the city of London, but also in other countries in Germany, Italy, um, you know, that, that, that were very discountenanced by the prospect of uh, financial sanctions on Russia. And of course, this is another you know, area where. I mean, I, I, I mean, I haven't seen any discussion of it in the Panama Papers. No one seemed very concerned that these sanctions would work well enough to no. to stop to stop people, including Vladimir Putin, getting their money out and around. No, no. Well, I mean, this is it, and, and, and the problem is always with this kind of sanctions. That you know, they're, they're, they're always you know, people always say that the aim is to try and uh, minimise the impact on uh, the ordinary people of, of, of the state affected. But guess what? You know, who, who tends to be affected most by sanctions? The ordinary people in the state affected. Uh, the elite always finds a way around. No, it's, it's, I mean, it's an interesting kind of dynamic. I mean, we've seen General Breedlove's appearance from other Europe talk about the weaponization of refugees, which, which seemed essentially to be an accusation that Russia was destabilizing Syria mm -hmm. with the deliberate strategic goal of destabilizing Europe through sending large numbers of refugees. Do you buy that argument, or do you think that's, that's not entirely? I, I mean, I think the situation suits Russia, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're entirely happy uh, to watch this uh, situation. But uh, we didn't need Russia to destabilize Syria. Syria was a doing, doing a fantastic first-class job of destabilizing itself before the Russians came along. 
and the conditions that created these refugee flows. Bear in mind that most of the refugees who have made their way to Northern Europe, or even Southern Europe, are people who were not fleeing directly from Syria. They'd already left some while ago for camps in Turkey, you know, Jordan, Lebanon, etc., and they'd given up. You know, they, they'd given, you know, they were hoping that, that they would be able you know, to effect a reasonably rapid return to their to their homes. And one day they woke up and realized this was not going to happen. And you know, what we have been seeing is progressive uh, uh, draining away from Syria of um, mainly um, upwardly mobile, educated, um, skilled, uh, middle class uh, people, uh, precisely those that the Syrian state can least afford to lose. But, but who didn't have a viable route back to the Syrian state. A, yeah, exactly, didn't. Uh, and I just didn't see um, a return to a viable Syrian state. Uh, and they've simply abandoned their homeland and gone off to seek their fortune elsewhere. What's, I mean, what's your worst case scenario for Syria at the moment? Do you think that we are, I mean, the head of the ICRC was in Harvard last week and said he thought that exhaustion was set again to the yeah. degree that we might be closer to the end game than, than, than some people would expect. That may be right. I mean, in the sense that uh, the ceasefire has held for a rather longer and rather better than anyone had imagined when it was uh, first, uh, first negotiated. Um, and I think it, it may well be that there's a degree of uh, uh, exhaustion setting in. I mean, uh, notwithstanding Assad's you know, hubristic uh, utterances lately, uh, the fact is that uh, he has been saved by two things. Firstly, the Iranian interventions, the you know, Revolutionary Guard, and so on. But they could only stem the tide, they couldn't reverse it. What reversed the tide was Russian airstrikes. So it's these two things that have um, um, kind of you know, saved the Assad regime. And even the Russians you know, have made clear their skepticism about uh, Assad's aspirations to recover you know, the whole country. Um, you know, I think nobody, nobody thinks that that is... I mean, uh, that's where the deal has to come in, right? Other people control the country, have to do a deal with them to put yeah. the country back together. Yeah. So I think, uh, sorry, if it, sorry. Can I ask, yes, uh, do you think that if the deal that the Russian was just waiting to get something out of it, as, as you say, that they are skeptical about Assad's yeah. remaining, they just... Uh, dealing with the, the, the West and, and the U.S. you know, to get the nuclear perception in Europe. Well, I mean, the exchange think, for a sign. Um, that may well be the way that Putin is thinking. I, I just don't know. Um, in, in, if that's a deal he's looking to strike, I think he may find it very difficult. You know, to, to uh, you know, get people to sign up to something as you know, kind of crudely transactional as that. Uh, but, you know, one, 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 one never knows. I mean, I think, you know, well, what is the future for Syria? Um, you don't see in Europe the uh, willingness to go along with that kind of option? I mean, I, I'm mm. really struck, and I'm here, but I watch because my country I'm in France, and I see a, a lot of forces now, and I, I see really a progress of this idea uh, in favor of, of such a scenario. I yeah. mean, you see a lot of French politicians openly yeah. calling for that, and I know that in London, quite mm. a few people are calling for that. Yeah, but I mean, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting trade. But uh, what would uh, what would Russia actually be able to deliver? I mean, I just want to say, uh, I don't think they can. I'm not sure they can. That's the point. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say, open up to any other questions. Um, anyone else got any other questions at this at this juncture? If you can uh, yourself at the back, just say if you can just say who you are and then ask a question. Um, my name is Alex. I just finished my master's at Berlin School of Economics, where I took a class actually on superintelligence with Sanka Neitzel. And my question is sort of strange, but Foreign Affairs magazine said that Francophone countries tend to be higher targets of terrorism yeah. and Islamic extremism. Why do you think this is? Is it because of politics or security policies, or is it simply a legacy of different colonial methods? Mm, interesting question. Um, I mean, obviously, you're talking, you know, when Francophone um, countries, you're talking not just about France, but about West Africa right. and, and the Sahel. Um, I'm not sure that it's. I, I'm not sure that the French language is uh, primarily uh, responsible for this. I have to say. Uh, I agree. I was just. Yes. I mean, the the Academy Francaise has much to answer for, but uh, <laughs> um, um, no, I, I I think it's much more to do with you know the particular set of circumstances that prevails, particularly in the Sahel where what has happened is you know you, you've had a particularly toxic mix of uh, 
uh, economic deprivation and underdevelopment, uh, a long-running, unrequited, uh, you know, Tuareg um, uh, aspiration to to have uh, its own uh, homeland of, of some sort, um, and the usual problems of uh, weak or non-existent uh, governance. You know, all, all, uh, you know, plus of course the fact that the Sahel. Uh, traditionally has been uh, a major um, cross-Africa transit point for trade, whether licit or illicit. So all of these things have kind of come come together. Um, actually, if you look at France and you know, Belgium, until relatively recently, they, they have not been uh, that... Uh, uh, I mean, they didn't invade Iraq, don't forget. So they, they didn't invade Iraq. They avoided, yeah. the, they avoided yeah. the Iraq backlash. Well, I think that is exactly right, Peter. Yes, that, uh, and, and part of what happened in, certainly in the UK was you know, quite clearly you know, connected you know, to the, the direct uh, in, in involvement in Iraq. Since then, of course, France has, uh, do, you know, uh, not least because they didn't carry with, they don't carry this incubus of, you know, sort of post-Iraq uh, war fatigue, um, uh, have been very you know, active uh, you know, in Libya, in, uh, in Mali, um, um, and, and, and you know that level of interventionism may well be a factor that, that is affecting uh, domestic uh, levels of, of radicalization within France. I mean, I think it's also worth. I mean, it's easy to say that you know Ivory Coast got just got hit. It's Frank moment, but I mean, East Africa, where, yeah. where the Ugandans and the Kenyans exactly. have been fighting a very long-running counterinsurgency campaign in Somalia, has been hit mm. way more yeah. than, than kind of than Christian West Africa. I mean, there's a bunch of reasons yeah. for that, not least that they're wanting Christian West. West Africa had a bowler last year, um, but um, you know I think I, yeah I, mean, I, 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 I don't know about Nigel, but my experience here, you know, if you've got yeah. a bunch of Anglo-Saxon foreign policy types, the chance to say so, they'll say something to me about the French. Yeah, and <laughs> and, and, and the converse will apply. Mm -hmm. Well, also that only talks, if I recall, that study was only about Syria. Yeah. It wasn't about anybody else. So Syria is the place didn't where. Cote d'Ivoire and Libya. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, the the way that the coverage was was that it was about Syria. Yeah. This is, yeah. Yeah. Quite the coverage. Right. But again, if you if you look at East Africa, the point that Peter picked up on, what you've got there is you know a, a raft of problems that, that intersect with a long running geopolitical issue of Somali irredentism. You know, so the, you know, the, the, these things, I mean I know that because you know there was a shift of wars in northern Kenya in the nineteen sixties. I remember them from you know direct personal experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, you know, so, so what what you're seeing um, is again you know, um, ideology radicalization as you know, uh, a kind of catalyst um, for situations you know, that, that already, are already largely there. Someone else had a question. Um, yes, the question. Uh, hi, my name is Kate Lavender. I'm a graduate student at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and a journalist in the Um So going back to Russia, can you just clarify for me, so if Russia is not interested in territorial expansion, um, or in any kind of beneficial economic relationship with periphery per countries. What is the main purpose of destabilization? Is it domestic and international political credence? I think it's basically to create a buffer zone. Okay. Yeah. So well, when you say they're not in favor of territory, I mean, actually, they, they do want to be able to destabilize the yeah. immediate area. Right? Yes, exactly. Even if it's like 25, 40 well, miles. Well, 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 what they really want to do is to deny anyone else, you know, a, a potential adversary, NATO, the United States, whatever, you know, the ability to um, exercise influence or effect in those territories. So it really is, I think, about you know, creating a buffer zone. I mean, they may have, in that they may have been. I'll let you follow up in a second. But I mean, in that they may have been perversely massively unsuccessful in right, the Baltics. Yeah. I mean, I think the British ambassador was there yesterday with the Salvation Army. It's sort of the, the you know, the hour group, the little remit. But in uh, you know, you're doing, you're doing you know, where EU NATO institutions are doing more in that frontline area than they would ever have done had Crimea not happened. Right? Oh. Absolutely, and, and you know there is now a serious debate about um, you know permanent basing in some of these areas, which you know, permanent basing quite far forward. Yeah, exactly. Which two or three years ago would, would, would have been anathema, and, and now people are talking seriously about this as uh, uh, you know as, as a prospect. So to that extent, yes. I mean, I think um, you know it's, uh, it it may um, you know it may turn out you know, to, to to have been. Uh, but I don't think it's going to stop the Russians from pursuing the policy. 
as I said, you know, their main concern is to make sure that nobody else is able to exercise uh, effect in their periphery um, um, to their detriment. Any other questions? Um, Melina. Um, Milan Robin, global fellow with FDS21. Um, what, what are, you, are your thoughts on the recent conflict between Apple and the FBI over okay. encryption? And what do you think is the private sector's role in helping fight terrorism? Yeah, system? well, you know, the, I mean, the, the, the Apple case has brought this into stark relief. I think it's a very, very bad case. And as lawyers, I want to say, you know, uh, hard cases make bad law. Um, it's not the greatest uh, terrain um, on, on, on which uh, to fight. I mean, a company like Apple it makes a huge contribution to, to the U.S. economy. I don't know what percent of uh, the U.S. economy um, derives. So it was America's most valuable company. Yeah, I think it may be, a, you know, it could be as much as 6% of GDP. It's massive. Um, and, and um, uh, trust, you know, it's a, it, is a, it is a multinational company. It does more business outside the United States than it does inside the United States by some some margin. Of course, it, it, it's not the only one. Um, and if um, significant levels of global distrust um, impact uh, to the detriment of Apple's business model, then, you know, that is a serious factor that has to be taken into account. I mean, it's worth research in motion who read BlackBerry yeah. and fell afoul of giving lots of keys to lots yeah. of governments yeah. and no one used well, the BlackBerry anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so there, there, there is an issue here. But, uh, I mean, at the same time, um, I do think that um, at the end of the day, um, governments should not have to contend with digital no-go areas. Um, the, the problem is you know, that, that it's very difficult to differentiate. You know, we're having this in, in the UK at the moment. There's a, a new uh, bill going through Parliament, the Investigatory Powers uh, Bill, which uh, actually doesn't uh, introduce anything substantially new, but kind of rationalizes and brings together under one piece of legislation um, all the um, um, Interception activities undertaken by the the, the British state, um, and I think you were one of one of the authors um, uh, one of the authors of one of the reports that was instrumental in bringing this about argued that you know, it, it, it was simply not conscionable. This was a, a, a very distinguished British senior lawyer. It was not con conscionable that there should be no go areas in which malign actors could. Uh, Operate, um, you know, confident. Because there are physical things, right? I mean, you can get yeah. you know, I mean, anyone's house can be bugged in yeah. those countries, providing you get a warrant. Yes, but the point is, the, my, my basic point is that you know, anyone can do this. The capabilities are out there. You know, what has to make the difference is process and purpose. And if you look at the situation that you've got in the United States, where you know intercept activities and surveillance activities are subject to pretty extensive. Uh, legal um, and oversight controls or the UK where the same thing applies. That is one thing. You know, China and Russia you know, very different uh, um, uh, approach. Um, and I don't know how we square this circle. I think it, it, you know, it is very difficult. But you know, my personal view is that you know, we, at the end of the day, Tim Cook is not you know, the moral guardian of uh, the universe. Uh, he's actually a gadget salesman. So, uh, and uh, you know, we, we need to get things uh, in respect. But, but there are broader issues, and you see this particularly with Google. Right? Google, yeah. Google view themselves as being the last line of defense yeah. of Chinese Gmail users against right. the Chinese state. Yeah. And I mean, both Google and Facebook do decide to turn down yeah. US and UK yeah, exactly. court orders all the time. Yeah, yeah, they do absolutely. Um, so you know, th th this is really difficult. But I, I do think. Um, you know that that um, there you know there, there does need to be um, some arrangement um, that you know, the governments of liberal democracies you know can uh, find the you know can can, can in the, the last analysis get access to some of these things. Now I accept that you know, that, that we've had a kind of golden age of um, access that is about to end. You know, and this this always happens. 
you know, in, 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 signal, in the signals intelligence world, uh, you have periods you know, when um, there is wide um, accessibility to communications, you know, ability to read. I mean, during the 1980s and 90s, when everything was uh, you know, traveling through uh, microwave links, um, none of it encrypted. You could literally kind of reach up and pluck this uh, you know, out of the ether, and there wasn't even any uh, physical evidence to demonstrate uh, whether or not you'd you'd done it. So you know, you, you pretty much do what you like. But that came to an end, and when it did, and when everything started going through fiber optic cables, signals intelligence agencies feared a world that for them would go dark. Although advantages, one has countries that all the cables run through. Well, the, 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 yeah, exactly. And the UK found itself in a situation in, in, in sort of 2000 that it had found itself in in 1900, where we sat at the center of all the world's telegraphic links and uh, you know, shamelessly read the lot, including those of the United States government, because we didn't have a spying agreement back then. Um, so, you know, so, so you know, the, 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 there was a bit of a pattern here. Um, and, 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 and I mean, I remember when, um, you know, when, when I was leaving government in, in 2006, you know, the discourse was about mastering the internet and, you know, a, a challenge, you know, and, and the debate was couched as a challenge that, uh, you know, uh, the uh, signals intelligence community might not be equal to. Well, you know, by the time Snowden made his revelations, it became apparent that uh, significant, huge progress uh, you know, had, had been made. I think the problem with this, you know the problem is with the Snowden revelations themselves, which created um, an image of what was possible that you know, to those of us on you know, being on the inside, it was vastly at variance with what was actually possible. And if you actually look at what a you know like look at a, you know, a signals intelligence agency like NSA, I don't know how many people they employed because that's classified, but let's say you know forty thousand plus change with contractors, you know. Now, if you uh, winnow out all those who are involved in the technology side of it, winnow out all those who are involved in administration, cooks and bottle washers, the number of actual analysts are going to get their hands on data and do something with it. And you know, the number of those who've actually got the language skills to you know, do something meaningful with it, you're looking at actually pretty small sets. But uh, you know that 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 case has not been made. The narrative of massive, you know, mass surveillance, a complete misnomer, uh, ha has uh, you know taken hold. That is the reality of the thing. That is what we've got to, to contend with. So I think you know the reality is that we, you know, we're going to see a world in which, for at least some while, um, things get darker. You know, and is that, a is that pro for the politics of technology? I think it's, it's a combination of both. I mean, the fact is that uh, the technology now enables um, end to end in, you know, a strong encryption to, to be um, made pervasive um, um, at, at costs which are kind of um, economically uh, sustainable. But of course, you know, this is an action reaction dynamic. What's the next thing coming down the track? Quantum computing. If quantum computing ever does get to the point where you know it is you know, uh, effectively operationalized, and you know if you look at what's happening with quantum computing, there's some very interesting things going on, but nobody's quite sure what these are or what effect they're going to have. Um, you know, but at least in theory, um, successful quantum computing would would blow away uh, all the encryption that we have uh, currently got. And there will presumably again be a bright, shining window of senior agencies where they had the three quantum computers and everyone else did. Well, I think, and then you would move on to the next stage. Exactly. And the, uh, the quantum computing would, you know, would become like you know, the yeah, 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 in the 1980s. Everyone would have one and the mobile phone. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and, and, and so it, it, it's always going to be you know, up and down. But I do think, you know, we're going back to this, that, uh, that um, you know, that, you know I, I, you know, Apple is you know, a multinational corporation, but it is incorporated in the United States and pay taxes here. It is a beneficiary of the public good of security that the United States government and its agencies uh, provide. I do feel, personally, I'm speaking purely personally, I do feel that they have a responsibility that they need to exercise. How we, how we get them to do this in a way that doesn't uh, damage their business model, and uh, that, that's an important qualification, I don't dismiss that at all, it, it is, is not straightforward. But I don't believe it's it's impossible to find a way. I take one more question at the back. Uh, my name is Justin Wilson, a communications and media strategist, and focus on international affairs. Uh, a past client was Turkey, and I know Turkey constantly 
complains that not enough is being done with information sharing. So my question is, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, I know there were some prominent examples in the last two years where UK young adults were um, either successfully got into Syria from Turkey or were thwarted from doing so based on uh, information sharing. Well, you know, the Turks probably have a point. Um, and, you know, information sharing in this domain is, is, you know, is a product of trust. Um, and there is, frankly, you know, rather less trust vis-a-vis uh, -vis, you know, Turkey at the moment. Um, What's driving that? I think, to some extent, I think it's the politicization of uh, the, the Turkish intelligence service, uh, which has become incredibly politicized. So part of the, and also which makes it part of the broader disquiet of a, of a, of a, of a Absolutely, uh, and indeed, I think. It, but, but I mean, you know, look, at the end of the day, um, you know, the, 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 what we're talking about here is very imperfect dark. We're never going to get a 100% uh, uh, record or, or anything uh, remotely like that. You know, the best systems that can be devised, you know, some things will get, you know, th you know, some things will get through, some things will happen. The point I make is that, uh, you know, the, 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 the Europe is an open society, not an open prison. Um, you know, we operate on the presumption that people can travel where and when they, you know, they wish now. to do so. Um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, you know, speaking purely personally, I'm kind of hoping that we'll be able to sustain that model because I don't want to live in a prison. But even when there's like site, like even one of these Belgian terrorists, for example, yeah. I think that they've said that that was someone flagged by Turkish authorities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm just purely. Yeah, just I'm, sure, I'm sure. I'm sure that is absolutely true. But what? what you know, I mean, but I would actually make the point, you know, based on 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 personal experience, that when these claims get made publicly by governments, um, the real issue is normally not about intelligence sharing or um, you know, the, the kind of technical and professional aspects of intelligence cooperation. The real purpose is political, to make a point. Oh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna fin to finish off there, but I thank you very much, Nigel. It's been a, a truly fantastic discussion. Um, we will continue to use and abuse your good offices as, as and when we can. Feel free to do so. Um, but thank you very much indeed. Thank you, everybody else. We were PS21. If you have been here, you will therefore be on our mailing list, so you'll be invited to other discussions. The next one will be a similarly exit, uh, excellent but broader discussion on Brexit uh, with a couple of Brits and a couple of pollsters and a couple of Americans who understand these things next week, um, I believe on the 13th at uh, 3 p.m. Uh, and uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So did you then describe to Edward Lucy's contention that think tanks are so 20th century? I think most of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but I, 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 I wouldn't want the word that actually has been toxic in the DC. <laughs>